Do you want to say that? Do you want to say? Start. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, in particular, Ethan's family. Um, welcome to uh, Ethan's um, inaugural lecture. So my name is uh, Sandrine Hoyt. I'm the head of the Department of uh, Materials. And it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome you. Uh, and firstly, it falls to me uh, to ensure that you're all safe and to note the uh, exits at the uh, front there uh, and here at the back. Um, yeah, this lecture theater is, is really packed and, and I think the lecture was oversubscribed. So, uh, you know, uh, we, we have to uh, uh, make sure that we can uh, all feel safe here and uh, um, exit in the, in the right way. Uh, so it's a particular pleasure for the materials department to celebrate Ifan's accession to the professorship um, as he was an undergraduate in materials in uh, 1997 to 2001 before moving on to Cambridge for his PhD, then MIT and Denmark. We were delighted to have him back um, in 2017, and he immediately made his mark in, in many ways, building a, a vibrant and diverse research group and founding the Electrochemistry Network. But we are, I'm sure we're gonna hear lots about this. Um, I should say one of Ivan's roles in the department um, that is kind of useful to, to, to all of us and, and um, uh, in, in the community here, is uh, a, a, as a project coordinator uh, with responsibility of allocating over 120, and that's a very understatement, uh, final year undergraduate and MSc projects uh, to his academic colleagues, which means he's incredibly popular. <laughs> <laughs> or rather, uh, the fact that this room is still so full of his friends, um, despite him assigning such a heavy workload, is really a testament um, to the, the great way that, that he does his job, his fairness and consideration in everything he does. Um, but I won't go over too many biographical details, as he's promising um, to do this, uh, to, to, to give us an overview of his personal and scientific journey over the last two decades. Ivan's talk is Chasing Volcanoes, Catalyzing Our Way to a More Sustainable Future. If, like me, you thought that this is a clever and intriguing title and did a bit of Googling on catalyzing volcanoes, you will find Ivan in two of the three top entries, <laughs> illustrating a catalysis principle linked to a 1912 Nobel Prize, such as Ivan's impact and established international renown that he is linked uh, to such um, distinguished discoveries. I'm also reassured that there will be no health and safety concerns that there might be um, if we were more in an earth science type um, uh, setting here. Ifan, congratulations on your success. Thank you for being a star in our department who is shining ever more brightly. And we're looking forward to hearing your story. Thank you. So, so thank you for the very kind introduction. So it really means a lot to me to have so many friends here today and so many uh, a family, as well as colleagues, former students, current students, and, and so forth. I think it's rare to have an occasion where you can unite everyone together. So it really means a lot that you're all here. So I'm, I'm going to start with some basics and define what, what is a catalyst. So, According to the definition I found, it's a substance that increases the rate of a chemical reaction without getting consumed. So interestingly enough, the origin is the early 20th century. But today, 
Tiletus forms a cornerstone of our modern society, produces fertilizers we use for agriculture, produces polymers or plastics, fuels, and uh, catalytic converters in automotive vehicles. So, to give a more specific example, one really important catalytic pro process is the Haber Bosch process, which a lot of you might have heard about at school. So, you basically react nitrogen and hydrogen to make ammonia. So, uh, two examples of a catalyst that actually can carry out this reaction one is nitrogenase enzyme in the roots of plants. So, it happens just under ambient conditions, so room temperature, atmospheric pressure. Well, the Haber Bosch process occurs in these really big plants. And the reason that occurs in these big uh, uh, plants is because you, you, need, um, you, you, you need very high temperatures and pressures, means you need uh, economies of scale to get it to work. And this, is a tip, this is an example of a nanoparticle catalyst. I believe this is ruthenium that they use to carry out the reaction. So it turns out that nature, at the end of the 20th century, they had an, uh, 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 an essay on the importance of the scientific discoveries of the 20th century and said, actually, the most important invention of the 20th century was the discovery of the Haber-Bosch process. So more important than penicillin, more important than the transistor, and uh, more important than many other things. I'll explain why in a minute. So typically what you're doing with a catalyst is you take a reactant, so in case of Halvosh, take uh, nitrogen and hydrogen, and you, you um, react it until you get the final product, ammonia. So you have a catalytic cycle. So here's electrochemical nitrogen reduction. You have nitrogen that absorbs. Then it gets hydrogenated. So the nitrogen atoms, the two blue atoms, and the hydrogen is a little white atom. So you sequentially add more and more hydrogen. You first one, make one molecule of ammonia, and you add more hydrogen again. And then you make a second molecule of ammonia, and you start with a clean surface, and nitrogen uh, goes on it again. So essentially what the catalyst does is you can think about it as trying to climb over a mountain. So this is the start point where you have nitrogen. This is the final point where you have ammonia. And a good catalyst will build a tunnel all the way through to minimize the amount of energy you need. So if you look at something like gold, so nitrogen is very, very inert, and gold is very, very inert as well. So it's a noble metal. It doesn't want to react. So it's really, really uphill to get nitrogen to react with gold. So it's like trying to climb up all the way to these huge peaks. And you probably won't actually get to the other side if you use gold as a catalyst. Conversely, if you look at something like rhenium, another metal that's a lot more reactive, then it's not so difficult to get nitrogen on in the first place. But then what tends to happen is you, you tend to get poisoned by some of these species containing nitrogen further down in the reaction. So the ideal catalyst will have a completely flat path from the start to the finish. So it would be like a tunnel going just straight across here. So I'm, I'm not going to make the uh, talk too dry, so I'm going to try and uh, I realize a lot of you are not scientists. So I'm going to try and intersperse some of the uh, science with some personal stories as well. So I think that as, as a physical scientists, we often try and make a model for trying to uh, end up uh, uh, to, to try and understand the phenomenon and apply it to other phenomena. So I guess the question is whether we could actually apply this kind of catalytic cycle towards my career. So people have asked me <laughs> if, if I've actually gone in a full cycle. So I started, as, as Sandri mentioned, started as an undergraduate. Then I, had some, uh, uh, I worked in, uh, in a consultancy. And then I was a PhD student. And then I did a lot of other things. I eventually went back to Imperial College. Um, so I, I think I'm, I, I can say I haven't been consumed in this process. <laughs> so this is probably not a, a very uh, apt uh, analogy. Um, so the other thing you could say is just that uh, everything's going better and better and better all the time. <laughs> um, but actually, uh, I have to say it's not the case. <laughs> so actually, so more likely is actually, so I'm probably more satisfied now than I ever have been in my career, but there's been a lot of ups and downs on the way. As well, and I think it's important, for, especially for the young scientists here, to kind of explain uh, what, what, what some of those ups and downs are. So now I'll go back to give a general motivation why catalysis is important. So I'll go back to the Haber Bosch process. Like I said, it was invented in 1913 it's for making ammonia. The reason it's important is ammonia is converted to make nitrates. For
of our body mass is nitrogen. So 1.6% of our body mass is, is actually from harbor Bosch processes. This is really, 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 really important. I can't think of anything else which has as much influence on our lives. So, um, and actually, if you look at this graph here, this is an estimate of what, what harbor Bosch has had on humanity, on the world population. So this is our current, uh, a few years ago, world population. And this is what the estimate is our world population would have been without harbor Bosch. Essentially, because before the Second World War, there were constant famines happening. And uh, the only way we, we got around it was actually using fertilizers. Um, but still many parts of the world, for example, sub-Saharan Africa, still lack fertilizers. And the, and the main reason for that is that ammonia on uh, uh, nitrates fertilizer is not particularly easy to transport or store. So you might recall the accident in Lebanon a few years ago of a, a nitrate fertilizer explosion. And, um, and in sub-Saharan Africa, because they lack transportation infrastructure, they often suffer from famine in, in those parts of the world without fertilizer. This is a big problem. And maybe the other big, big problem is Harbour Bosch is not sustainable at all. So hydrogen comes from natural gas, methane. So it's about 1% to 2% of global emissions, which is equivalent to the global aviation industry. So if I want to go to net zero by 2050, we need to get rid of this or completely uh, decarbonize uh, fertilizer production. So, um, so I've given this specific example for ammonia production. So as I mentioned, ammonia is used for making fertilizers. So I find this diagram quite useful. It's a Sankey diagram showing the energy inputs and energy outputs in the global chemical industry. So you can see the kind of products we make, apart from fertilizers, are thermoplastic, solvents, uh, and so forth. And typical building blocks, uh, apart from ammonia, also ethylene, methanol, to a lesser extent, also hydrogen peroxide. But all the energy input right now comes from fossil fuels. So we need to completely get rid of these fossil fuels as a source of power for the chemical industry. So the really positive story over the past few years has actually been the rise of renewable energy, or more specifically, if you look at the mean cost of electricity, it's dropped really, really dramatically. Sorry, electricity from renewables, more specifically. If you went back further, you'd see that it dropped many orders of magnitude, especially from solar. So now if you look at the mean cost of electricity, it's actually cheaper than the fossil fuel equivalent if you get it from renewables. And um, because of this increased, uh, uh, what they increased, uh, uh, the, the decreased cost of renewables, if you look at last year, actually, there's a big jump in the amount of renewable electricity stored. Still not happening fast enough, but it is happening. Um, so could we use electricity to power the uh, chemical industry? So the answer is, well, to my mind, yes, we could use electrochemistry. So I'm, a, as, as you might have noticed from my title slide, I'm a professor in electrochemistry. So electrochemistry is a branch of chemistry that deals with the relations between electrical and chemical phenomena. So whether you know it or not, we're all familiar with electrochemistry. Uh, so all of us carry a smartphone. Also, uh, they, they have lithium-ion batteries in them. And also, the, uh, we now start to see a lot of automotive vehicles being sold in the UK made from lithium-ion batteries. Also, large-scale uh, processes already using electrochemistry industry, including the production of chlorine and the production of aluminium. So for those chemicals I mentioned previously, um, so, uh, like ammonia, ethylene, and methanol, hydrogen peroxide, it turns out um, we've been able to use, make them using electrochemistry, so using electricity. So in principle, we could actually eventually use renewable electricity to make these really important chemical building blocks. So, um, so I've been able to make them, as I mentioned, in my lab, not always just in the lab, also we've started a spin-out company, we're making hydrogen peroxide electrochemically as well. So it turns out for a lot of the processes I'm looking at, they occur at quite low temperatures. Um, you need a good catalyst at the electrodes. And the elect uh, electrocatalyst is what you call the catalyst in an electrochemical device. So that's why what I and my group investigate. So to appreciate what a, 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 a catalyst is, I've got a cross section here of a water electrolyzer. So essentially what you've got, so what you, 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 you could, an electrolyzer could be a means 
of making hydrogen. So essentially what you do is you split water into hydrogen and oxygen uh, using electricity, ideally from renewables. So you have in the middle a membrane that only conducts protons, and at the side you have the electrochemical reactions. You have hydrogen being involved on one side and oxygen being involved at the other side. So electrocatalyst is actually these little nanoparticles here. So you have uh, iridium oxide nanoparticles at the anode, electrode, and you have uh, platinum dispersed on carbon at the cathode. So ideal way of actually testing different electrocatalysts would be just take actual device and put it together. But you can imagine doing it is not that easy because there's a lot of different steps to put it together. So it's, it becomes, uh, uh, it's difficult to actually then see what, what's the fundamental effect of changing the material. And if you, if you look at these materials, you can see like this platinum, nanoparticles, these black dots, have a lot of different sizes and shape, and each different size will have a different reactivity. So often what we do is try to look at more model systems and the more model conditions where we're just changing uh, 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 parameters uh, more carefully. So for example, we often look at uh, size-selected nanoparticles. So these are typical size nanoparticles, that's five nanometers across. Um, or we look at oriented thin films, even look at single crystals, that's five millimeters across. So it's quite interesting if you just consider the length scale completely different from this. It's about a, 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 a million times difference between the size of these particles and this uh, single crystal here. So whereas in, in an actual device, you often use a polymeric solid electrolyte. Often what we use instead is liquid electrolyte instead, and we rotate it to, to, uh, uh, to stir the solution and bring reactive gases to and from the electrodes we're studying. So, um, so using this, we can get and uh, study the role of a catalyst under very well-defined conditions. And, um, uh, so, and often what we do is I, I collaborate a lot with, I keep on touching the wrong keyboard. So um, I collaborate with, with, with a lot of people doing uh, theoretical chemists, synthetic chemists, and people doing characterization. Ideally, what we'd like to do is discover new materials um, in a seamless loop. We're not always, we're always it, the loop usually gets broken at some point up to now, but ideally we would be working in a closed loop following this schematic. So I'll give you a few examples of that now. So I guess first I'll start off with what drew me to electrochemistry. So as I mentioned, well as, as Sandrine already mentioned, and I mentioned as well, I was an undergraduate at the Department of Materials here at Imperial College. So here I am actually in the middle here. This is in 2001. And actually it's really funny actually being back here because uh, it's a bit like when you see a film with a different uh, remade in the same spot with different actors because pretty much everyone has changed. So Mary, who will give a vote of thanks later, has just arrived. She's the cool new lecturer. And um, actually, I think the only full-time member of staff was Derek Shun, who's uh, 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 from the whole, um, from the whole uh, 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 department at the time, if I'm not mistaken. Apologies if I have uh, uh, omitted someone. So for me, moving here to, to be at Imperial College was really, really a big thing. It was very, very exciting. Um, uh, so actually, it's funny actually looking back at th that period, we didn't really have uh, so many uh, social media or smartphones. So I didn't have actually any photos of being a student. I had photos of me graduating, but not working in the lab or anything like that. So, but I, I really, really uh, enjoyed being here in the department and, uh, and also be living in London. So it was very, very exciting and it was very cosmopolitan and, uh, uh, and also it was very scientifically stimulating. So I was very lucky. To, we had as a John Kilner, as a who's now a, a professor emeritus in the department. He was our lecturer for electroceramics. And he was the one who really brought me into electrochemistry. It just shows what, how important a good teacher is indeed. So essentially, what he, he's a keen advocate for hydrogen fuel cells. So you might remember, so actually, so people ask me, are there going to be any explosions? I hate explosions. <laughs> So, so, uh, so I, I have an aversion to explosions, so I'm afraid I'll only have to show you uh, an explosion by video. <laughs> but but th this is a balloon filled with hydrogen and oxygen. If you uh, detonate it, it explodes and releases a lot of energy. So that's making, relaxing hydrogen and oxygen, you make water. So a fuel cell, actually, what it does is harnesses the energy in a much more controlled way. So essentially, you don't have hydrogen and oxygen next to each other. You get them separated by a membrane. The membrane conducts ions 
of oxygen through it. And um, so the kind of fuel cells that John Kilner is keen on is, is a, a, a solid oxide fuel cells that work at high temperatures. Um, so tip, it's like a battery essentially, but you feed it fuel. And typically what you'll do is you put a lot of these fuel cells in series and you make a stack and then you can power a home with this fuel cell. And this kind of fuel cell what usually works very efficiently. So I was very excited after my favorite lecture actually allowed me to be, well, I'm not sure if it's him who allowed it, it was probably the master's project coordinator at the time, but allowed me uh, to, to actually do my master's project with him. And so we were actually looking at the materials you use for this membrane. So we're looking at oxides, it's a mixture of metal and oxygen that were doped. So we're looking at cerium doped oxides and usually when you put a dopant, you make a, 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 a vacancy, so like a hole in the structure. And when you heat it up, you'll find the oxygen ions actually go through this, this. And this is really important to, to, in order to allow this uh, fuel cell to work. So usually they work at several hundred degrees Celsius. There's a lot of uh, people who are interested in trying to get the temperature to go lower for many practical reasons. Um, so what you want is to get the oxygen to move as easily as possible. So essentially what I did was that I studied um, how the activation energy for our oxygen transport, so essentially uh, changed as a function of amount of neodymium, so the second metal you put in this oxide. So the activation energy is essentially telling you how big is the energy barrier for the oxygen to jump around. So the higher the value, the, the more difficult it is. And what we found is actually that the, the um, activation energy was lower than what people had reported for any other materials. And it was slightly counter counterintuitive, because previously because neodymium is it has a slight size mismatch with a cerium oxide, and people usually thought you need to minimize the size mismatch. So this is, this is uh, exciting for me. So, um, so in principle, if you could optimize it further, you could even use it eventually in a fuel cell. It hasn't happened, but there, there, was, there was hope at the time. So I think, so I really, really relished those meetings I had with John Kilner back then, uh, and it was really inspirational experience for me. And actually, I even got a few years later actually published this paper as first author. Um, so, I, I, and what really I liked about it was the electrochemistry, or ion, ionics, as uh, John would call it. It leverages atomic skill insight to solve problems that are really important for humanity. And I also found scientific research exciting uh, and rewarding, I learned from this as well. This is important for what comes next. So despite that, actually, I, I actually, I, I thought, I want to stay in London, and I thought, I don't want to just, uh, and if I'm gonna stay in London, I probably want to stay at Imperial College, but I don't want, I, I thought that that was a bit limiting, so uh, it's, I'm not ready to go back to Imperial College yet. Um, so I wanted to do something different. So I decided, why not work uh, as an engineering consultant? So I went to work in Bureau Happold Consulting Engineers. So this is me actually, again, like I mentioned, I didn't have any photos of me being professional, but this is a photo of me on holiday <laughs> in, uh, in LA. So uh, it was just, uh, it's, it's quite convenient, it was just um, uh, north of Oxford Street. And the thing was, so I thought, okay, people, I'm a material scientist, people use a lot of different materials for facades. Uh, I was in the facades department for facades of buildings. And uh, I, I have a lot of really useful insights. I was really wrong, actually. So all I had to do in the end was just count cracks in all these famous buildings around London. And people, I'd have builders shouting at me saying, you don't know anything. Who are you? And I'd be like, I, I just study ceramics and glasses. <laughs> but but, but um, and, uh, so I remember looking at Cumberland Hotel and Marble Arch with binoculars for December. Um, <laughs> it looked, felt like a spy. <laughs> but I, I, I re so I learned a lot from this experience. I realized it really wasn't for me. Um, so I think construction industry is really conservative in use of new materials because you want the material to last for a long time. And have no aptitude for thinking in 3D. So I remember I had to count all the surface area types on, the, on this Brun, on the Brunswick building. It was horrible. It's like I, I had to think in 2D or even in 1D. So I'm, I, and I'm really I'm, I'm more interested in molecular scale phenomena, the macroscopic phenomena. And I kept on getting told that I was too academic as well. So really, there was, there was no option for me to go back to academia. So I went to actually do a PhD at Cambridge University. Um, and I supervised with Derek Frey. So what I looked at was uh, catalysts. This is the first time I actually started working with catalysts for redox flow batteries. So redox flow batteries are essentially a way of, uh, it, they're like a regular battery except that you, you, you charge up a solution and you store it in a separate tank. 
And the, what, the reason you store it in a separate tank, because there's usually in a regular battery, the amount of energy you can store is uh, controlled by the dimensions of the, of the cell. But if you store it in a separate tank, you decouple the two. So this would be really useful for large-scale energy storage. So uh, the premise of my PhD was that these uh, special tungsten and sul sulfide materials uh, would be really good as catalysts. Um, so my PhD years were, were a lot of fun. Um, so I had a lot of nice dinners, and we did typical Cambridge things, which I would probably not do now, but I, I still did then. But I go, go to Mayball, and this is, uh, and this is me. This is the only photo I had in my lab of my late uncle Anthony. And um, despite that, something was amiss. If you look here, actually, this is the only paper I published for my PhD, and I published it 10 years after I started my PhD, <laughs> which is not good at all. And it was actually uh, really quite a terrible experience for me. So I, I actually, the, so, the, um, so the problem was actually the company was sponsoring me. They got closed down two months after I started, and I thought, OK, this is going to be great. I have even more freedom. But actually, I was the only aqueous electrochemist, the only electrochemist working with uh, water. And everyone else was working above 500 degrees. I was working at room temperature. So I really had to learn everything myself. So the basic premise of the PhD was actually that these particles would be really good at, at oxidizing and reducing sulfides in solution. So, um, so typically, tungsten sulfide has a layered structure. This is how the atoms look. And you usually have these little platelets. You have edge planes here, and then you have the basal planes. It's the flat planes here. So what you do in these uh, fullerene-like structures, like balls, you essentially remove these edge planes. They're all curved over. So we thought there was a lot of hype about nanomaterials at the time. Uh, about 20 years ago, and, and, and a lot of people thought, if it's nano, it's good. So, um, so then, actually, I tested the material. So essentially, what this is, so here you've got what's called a taffel plot. So it's a potential. Uh, so it's, I should say, it's a, it's a current density. So this is a reaction rate. So you want this to be as high as possible. The potential is how much, how much a push you give to the reaction. So ideally, you want as high currents as possible, as close as possible to the theoretical value, which is here on either side. So this is when you're going one, uh, uh, driving the battery one way, this is when you're driving the other way. And what we found is actually this really novel nanomaterial is actually terrible for, for, for the reaction. And so even regular not nanomaterial uh, was actually better. And I was running out of time in my PhD, and I thought, well, how can I actually make it better? And make the, uh, so actually, I did uh, it's brute force. So I just took the tanks and sulfide particles and put them in what's called a ball mill, and you shake it around and batter it to pieces, and then you ended up having a lot more uh, 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 defects. So I think if I'd really read my literature properly, I, I thought I read well, I'd learned that actually the catalytic reactor phase is actually the edges. And by removing the edges, you make these particles really, really useless. <laughs> so, um, so that was a bad experience for me, actually. So I didn't finish my PhD until 2010. I did graduate eventually, uh, and it's it it a proud day for my family, but a, a, a slightly painful day for me. Um, but um, but I, did, I did learn a lot from my PhD. So I, what did I learn? So everything I learned was the hard way, with almost nothing to show for it at the end of my PhD. So I had no papers except for my master's. Um, and I thought, realized material synthesis is really, really difficult. So I'd leave that to other colleagues like Magda. Um, <laughs> Despite the hype, nanostructural materials are often better than, for, than other materials, but in this case, they were terrible. So, when, so really, I think what was quite important when you think about tailoring the functionality of materials, you should first establish what characteristics are needed, rather than thinking that looking at materials that are interesting to synthesize or what looks nice in the microscope as well. Um, so I found PhD a lot more difficult than masters. But I did find my calling. I thought that was electrocatalysis. I thought it would be good to do research in a group whose goals are more aligned with my own. So then I actually went to Denmark um, uh, 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 just in, in January 2008 without a PhD starting a postdoc. It was, nobody could ask me about that. So every time someone asked me about a PhD, I changed the topic and I got really <laughs> scared, <laughs> even with my family. So. Um, it was, it was a really, really difficult experience, because it was difficult to tell people say, oh, you must have papers. I said, no, I don't have any papers except for my master's. So it was really, really hard, actually. But actually, so then I, I, I did, uh, so I was a postdoc until December 2010. So I remember the first two years, I didn't even have a PhD. 
Um, and then actually I became assistant professor. Uh, it was really, I kind of got, became assistant professor through the back door because they, they essentially, a senior professor had left and they said, do you want to be a professor? I said, sure, I didn't even have an interview. <laughs> so I was very, so after the hell I had for, for, from my PhD, I actually was very, very fortunate in that way and I was quite privileged. Um, so my director of our center was Eve Kirkendorf. The first thing he said, we're here to do good science. I thought this is actually something that fits in well with me. So, the, well, so in, in, in the group, the ten, what they tended to do was work with more conventional, he, uh, traditional heterogeneous catalysis, like the Harbour-Bosch catalyst that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Um, and they, we barely had an electrochemistry lab, actually. So we didn't, it actually wasn't a lab at all. It was, we were in an office full of theorists, and we had, so le electrochemists usually work with, with, with wet chemistry, so you usually expect to have a sink. We didn't even have a sink in the lab. <laughs> it was in an old office. But it was really good, actually. I worked a lot with really closely with theorists, and they're actually the, probably the leading theorists in my field. Um, so aside from the science, I also had a lot of fun. Uh, this is actually the lab. This is interesting. We traveled a bit to different places and uh, showed my parents around uh, Copenhagen. And it was, it, was, it, was, it was nice, even though the first two years, I just completely stayed at home all the time. I didn't make new friends, I just, uh, uh, but I, I, I just ho hoped to be working on my thesis when I didn't actually do anything. <laughs> so um, anyway, so the, the, the thing we were trying to work on, or we were working on, was looking at polymer electrolyte membrane fuel cells. So they're also for, for getting power out of hydrogen, um, similar to ones I showed before, except they work at much lower temperatures. Um, so typically, so you feed hydrogen into the cell, and you feed oxygen, you make water, and then you put, stack the cells together, and then you put them into a car. So there's, uh, or you could put them even into a, whoops, in, even into a truck. Um, so I know lithium-ion battery cars are, are, are now all the rage, but actually, I think there's still potential for for, for um, fuel cell cars, and they're particularly useful for for for, for uh, trucks and also for trains and even for aeroplanes. Um, so I've actually, I've, I've been, uh, so Toyota is a company that's lead, really at the forefront of fuel cell. I visited them twice. Um, so the first time I visited them, actually they offered me the chance to drive their fuel cell car. I had to decline because I haven't driven for 15 years. Uh, I don't think I would have been invited to the second time if I had actually driven it. Um, so the good thing, so you're powered by hydrogen. Hydrogen is really, really light. And uh, and you can just uh, refuel a fuel cell instantly. So, so it, it compares a lot more favorably relative to batteries in that respect. But there's a catch. You need a lot of platinum catalysts at the electrode. So why, why do we bother using platinum? It seems like stupid, really. Well, partially, it's because you're working a very acidic electrolyte. It means every, every metal dissolved except for platinum and gold. And also, because you need high catalytic activity or reaction rates. So luckily, in the group where I was, uh, they were doing a lot of theoretical calculations to try and understand electrochemical systems. And electrochemists, usually what we do is we measure currents as a function of potential, and we try and conjecture what's going on. And it's very rough because it's very difficult to uh, uh, understand this complicated uh, um, surface. So actually, what they, what they do, and uh, 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 so my former colleagues, Jens Snuskov and Jan Rosmeister, They'd had a lot of experience looking at more simple systems based on the gas phase catalysis, and they translated a lot of that knowledge to electrochemical systems, where you have a solvent in a way it's a bit more complex. So essentially, what for an oxygen reduction in a fuel cell, you want to go from oxygen to water as easily as possible. So essentially, so you have an oxygen molecule, then you protonate it, you add a, a hydrogen there, so these two are the oxygen atoms, Protonate further, you make one more oxygen molecule, water molecule, and then protonate further, you make hydroxyl, and then you make water. So this is the overall pathway. So ideally, you want to react with all these different species, but you don't want to react too strongly with them, otherwise you'll never go the complete cycle. So you need to bind in, an intermediate amount to it. The problem is that all of them bind by the oxygen atom, so they all bind in a very similar way. So this actually means Actually, it constrains the reaction somewhat. Um, so so the, the, the problem is actually the binding energies of the, how, how strongly all these different species are bound actually correlated to each other. So this constrains the reaction and constrains the efficiency of uh, fuel cells. But the good thing is if you know the binding of one 
of these different reactive intermediates and know the binding of the other intermediates. So then you get what's called a volcano plot. So this is what from the title in, uh, from my talk. So essentially, so what, in catalysis, what we say is when, we, when you, the optimum catalyst should bind uh, moderately to the reaction intermediate. So in this case, if you look at something like gold, gold would be really, really difficult to react. With oxygen, gold is a noble metal. Um, if you look at, uh, and you'd be limited by uh, reaction with oxygen. Or if you look at a very reactive surface like molybdenum or iron, so you know iron reacts readily with oxygen to make rust. Um, you'll also get poisoned by the uh, 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 reaction with oxygen. So platinum is actually ideal because it has a moderate binding to reaction intermediates. You could get even higher if you just weaken the binding to oxygen a little bit further. So this is what the volcano plot. So this is actually, as Sandrine mentioned at the beginning, is actually an old principle from the Nobel Prize uh, winner, Paul Sabatia, from, from over a century ago, um, who, said, who indeed said that almost optimal catalysts should exhibit moderate binding to reaction intermediates. So it turns out, actually, the first time this Sabatia principle was applied in electrocatalysis was actually by Imperial College alumni, Roger Parsons. But he, he had a purely, um, he, at the time, he didn't have any data to populate it, but it was more a supposition. Um, so now today, actually, volcanoes are everywhere in uh, electrocatalysis or catalysis at large, even on oxides here for oxygen production, previously I was showing metals, and also for the Haber-Bosch process. You know, the ruthenium works best because of moderate binding to nitrogen. Um, so usually when you look at these volcanoes, actually, what typically people do is they either have theoretical activity, and the theoretical activity is a function of a theoretical uh, binding to reaction intermediates, or they have a more indirect experimental descriptor on the x-axis. So um, one of the nice things well, uh, well, we had we, uh, in um, uh, DTU was the ability to work with single crystals. So essentially what you can do is you can take a macroscopic crystal. It's all been oriented to expose almost entirely one crystal facet. So this is a closely packed plane of platinum. So you can see all the balls closely packed together. And I was working with Alexander Bandarenko, a really good team in the lab, in our very rudimentary lab, actually. And what we found is actually, we found some theoretical studies saying, if you just put a little bit of copper in the very surface layer, you should be able to weaken the binding of platinum to reactive intermediates. And, um, and we thought if we could just change the amount of copper, we could actually uh, try and map out the volcano. And this is what we did. Actually, this is the theoretical prediction. This is actually the experimental prediction. And we, we didn't get quite reach the maximum predicted by theory, but this is to be expected. So th this is as good as we could possibly hope for agreement between experiments and theory. So this is really exciting for us to work on. So we later tried to actually look for other new alloys, because the problem with actually this alloy is relying on just a tiny amount of copper. That copper will leach away in the acidic environment of a fuel cell. So bulk alloys, where you have the uh, uh, same composition throughout the middle, would be more appropriate. So typically, what we, we were looking at alloys of platinum and rare earth metals, lanthanides more specifically. And typically, what we found was they formed a very uh, compressed platinum structure at the surface. And the nice thing with the lanthanides is they have quite a boring chemistry. They're all the same. The only thing you're changing is actually the, the size of the atom. So we suppose, well, we think that the activity is controlled by the platinum-platinum distance at the surface. So that means we should be able to actually uh, uh, reach optimal activity by just changing the, the, lan the lanthanides. And this is exactly what we did. We've got another volcano here, actually. And we've got extremely high activity. So a good thing about this, if you put this, in principle, in a fuel cell, you could get away with using uh, uh, about, uh, about five times less platinum. So you could actually use uh, 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 scale-up fuel cells more easily. So apart from actually looking at oxygen reduction to water, which is with a key reaction fuel cells. We also thought, what else can we use this reaction for? So um, in fuel cells, you should make water. There's another product you can make, which is hydrogen peroxide. There you um, maintain the oxygen-oxygen bond, and then uh, you don't, you don't, uh, you don't uh, split it apart. So some of you might be familiar with hydrogen peroxide as, as a bleaching agent. It turns out it's actually very environmentally friendly. Has no, it's not toxic like chlorine, and its use is going up a lot. And um, it's used 
especially for bleaching paper, uh, also for cleaning wastewater, and also for chemical synthesis. So right now it's produced in uh, centralized locations. Um, centralized locations are very high concentrations. There's about 55 plants in the world. So then you make it high concentration, then you have to transport it to the point of consumption. Um, so this is not without its dangers. There's been two very well documented accidents, including an M25 motorway, where people had a big canister of hydrogen peroxide, it broke apart and exploded. So usually, if you're trying to clean water of hydrogen peroxide, you only need a really, really low amount of it, around 0.1%. So we started talking to people in the industry, and said it'd be great if you could actually use electrochemistry for making hydrogen peroxide. We said, well, actually, you can. But we didn't really understand why people were not trying to do it. So Essentially what you can do is all you, all you need is hydrogen, sorry, all you need is water and oxygen and electricity, and then you can get dilute peroxide in pure water. What's really important is that you, you keep intact the oxygen oxygen bond and don't make the more thermodynamically stable product, which is water. So we, we started looking at the literature actually, and people have been able to do it, but they were not doing it particularly efficiently. So we had the idea actually. Uh, what we were actually trying to do better. Uh, in particular, we had the idea, well, why not use a platinum mercury alloy? And what you can do in platinum mercury is you, you, you make an amalgam, so you electrodeposit mercury onto platinum, it makes a crystalline alloy at room temperature, and you have isolated platinum sites. And I think what, what's really important to maintain this oxygen-oxygen bond is not to have two contiguous platinum atoms. So then they, um, uh, it meant that they're actually, the, uh, you need two contiguous platinum atoms to, to actually break the oxygen-oxygen bond. So if you have uh, uh, isolated atoms, you can end up making hydrogen peroxide. So we test it, and this is a current reaction rate as a function of potential. So ideally, you want to be up here. We're very close to ideal. So we're very excited about this result. Um, and we tried to actually think, well, let's commercialize it. And we start talking to people from industry, and they said, no way, we're not working with mercury. So uh, uh, even though I said, well, people are using mercury now, but they said nobody's going to invest in something that's trying to be eradicated. But I think we did actually show that you could actually get really, really high activity. Uh, uh, and it was actually quite easy to try. We still managed to commercialize our invention. So we now make hydrogen peroxide in something that looks like this washing machine sized container, a bit taller. And we're now um, selling units in 15 different countries all around the world. So I'm sure you'd agree there's nothing more pleasing than to look at the Spanish farmer uh, in Welba with uh, blueberry farms, uh, making organic blueberries and smiling. <laughs> but um, on a more serious note, I think, we're now getting to the point, we've got a lot of renewable electricity, and, um, and uh, the surplus electricity can drive for the decentralized production of our most needed chemicals as well. Um, so, in my time in Denmark, what I learned, I learned a lot. Actually, it was, it was a really positive experience. So it was important to be in the right place at the right time. I really was there. So actually, when I, uh, when I arrived at the, in, the, in the department, I was pretty much the only uh, experimental electrochemist. When I left, almost everyone was an electrochemist. Um, but I thought, realized electrochemistry is challenging, but actually really rewarding. So leading a subgroup of 10 talented researchers allowed me to step out beyond Oxygen reduction, I'm not showing the results today, but also for things like water electrolysis, CO2 reduction, alkane valorization, and nitrogen reduction. And uh, theory, theoretical chemistry can be extremely accurate in predicting experimental trends. There's volcanoes everywhere. But you need really carefully designed experiments to prove theory. Um, also, I started to learn about how important it was to speak to context in industry. Uh, it was a surprise to me we actually that the uh, research actually led to patents of real industrial products like hydrogen peroxide. And the other thing I learned is because I pretty much did all my PhD in isolation, the science is actually so much more fun, and more powerful in collaboration. So despite all the positive experience I had in Denmark, I, I also started getting slightly itchy feet. So I remember actually one specific experience. So Yang Xiao Horn from MIT was uh, uh, at the Create campus in Singapore, and she invited me over. Actually, the first time I went there, I realized at the last I couldn't check in. I realized actually I'd forgotten to renew my passport, so everything got delayed by a week. But I, I went there, so that I really enjoyed the foods in Singapore, and I really enjoyed the conversations I had with, with Yang. And uh, I remember there was actually at this restaurant in this photo. She so asked, Wouldn't you be interested in rising to challenge of running your own completely independent research group one day? And to help me in that process, actually, 
Yang actually helped me get a, a visiting professorship at MIT in the main campus in Boston, where I taught and conducted research for six months. Here's me about to teach. Um, so there, actually, we started continuing with some of the research that I've been doing already in Denmark on water electrolysis. In particular, uh, in water electrolysis, in, in the PEM electrolyzer that I showed a cross-section before, the limiting step is actually going from water to oxygen. So this is the reverse of the, uh, 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 of the uh, limiting step in fuel cells. So it turns out, actually, you can make a volcano to describe the catalytic activity for oxygen evolution. This is based on uh, theoretical structures, usually modeled in vacuum. Um, and but often, to make these kind of volcanoes, they have to look at idealized surfaces. Uh, and it's very difficult to, to actually calibrate it against experiments and know if it's really the case. And because often, they have to make assumptions in the way, and the more assumptions they make, the more onerous uh, the assumptions are, and the more, more, the more difficult to, more, more, more they are varying from reality. So they still, the theorists still need us as experimentalists to give them a helping hand. So what was really nice actually there, so I, in um, Imperial College, uh, no, sorry, I, I, MIT, I started working with Reshma Rao. Actually, I taught Reshma, who's now a lecturer in the department, and we started collaborating. And we actually used that surface X-ray diffraction. We could probe on a single crystal, similar to the platinum crystal show, before we could actually probe the position of the different ruthenium and oxygen atoms under applied potential, we found previously unidentified intermediates. We even expanded our analysis to multiple surfaces, and we found a volcano. So it's was, it was, it was quite nice as a, as a proof that we can start to get atomic scale insight into catalyst controlling water electrolysis. So, so, so overall, my experience in MIT was also really positive. I thought that I learned on a scientific approach uh, level, we can strive towards the same level of molecular scale understanding on metal oxide catalysts we have on metals. And also in, in Yang's group, they're also very interested in, in, in actually uh, uh, approaches beyond aqueous or water-based electrochemistry, for example, batteries. This also sparked my interest a bit. As I also realized from Yang the importance of a mentorship to early career researchers. And also, I think what was quite useful in the US is actually people are very aware of the career trajectory. That made me a bit more aware of where I needed to go. So eventually, I thought, okay, I want to go back to the, I thought about going to the US, but I thought actually I really want to go back to, 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 to UK, and back to, more specifically to Imperial College. Actually, I applied in 2015 while I was at MIT to the chemistry department. So I got an interview, but I didn't get it. I think I was probably too nervous at the time. James can tell you more, he was actually on the panel. <laughs> So, so um, um, but eventually, I, I did actually come here in 2017. So this is me on the eve of my interview. I remember actually Peter Haynes called me when I was in the tube to, the, um, to, to, to Heathrow, and he told me that, that, that I got the job. I actually started crying. I said that actually, a, a, a woman asked me, are you right, love? I said, yeah, I was crying out of joy. <laughs> so this is my uh, leaving reception at DTU, the leaving party of my friends in Copenhagen. I'm saying for, for, for goodbye to my good friends Valerio and Carlotta, and this is my new academic home here. I'm with Luca and Dan, who are in the audience today as well. Um, so this is really nice to be here at Imperial College. It was tough at the beginning because I'd gone from a place where I was extremely well resourced, having to start everything from scratch again, and then had to teach as well. So I think for teaching, um, I have had lows and highs. So, so, so in particular, at MIT, I had very, very little experience. Um, teaching, so I, 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 and then I had a, I think, well, I think students really appreciate it if you, if you can write out equations and, uh, and explain everything by hand. They don't like it when I do it at all. <laughs> <laughs> My handwriting's terrible, and in MIT they, they actually complained if you use PowerPoint. So you had to, and you had to juggle all these different blackboards, it was horrible. I remember actually the first time I taught there, a student told me, how many more times are you gonna be doing this? I said, <laughs> oh, well, I said, we've got another eight more hours. She said, eight more hours is hell. <laughs> So it was really, so I learned, and then there's obviously another time, actually, some of you in the audience, I think the third years here, would remember, actually, last year when I was teaching my course on corrosion, I went to the gym in the morning, and then I came out of the shower, and I didn't have my trousers. <laughs> so I had to teach in, in gym shorts. But despite that, we are very lucky to have 
very kind students here. And they did actually, uh, in 2019 to 2020, despite all my faults, that I did actually get an award for teaching, which is a positive thing. So, um, so I think what's really nice here at Imperial College, there's a lot of focus on collaboration between departments. So I, even though some of you, uh, some of you will be aware, I'm actually based, uh, my lab is based in White City, but I'm here half the time for teaching. Um, we still manage to get along, and, I, and there's a lot of uh, multi-departments initiatives. And as my, uh, Sandrine said earlier, actually, we, we found this electrochemistry network at Imperial. Um, so we, we, we did a lot, of, uh, we started in the pandemic in April 2020, and we'd have a lot of seminar training, and we had industry day. Uh, and um, what's really nice is actually because, the, actually, Imperial College has a really long history in electrochemistry. I hope I can visit it. It's a really important area of research. And actually, um, today we have about 60 academics, different research groups involved in electrochemistry one way or another, which is actually maybe the definitely largest amount in the UK, maybe the largest amount in Europe. And, and I think it was quite nice to actually uh, get, all get together uh, and re re take ownership of this community. Um, so finally, for my last part of my talk, I know I'm running out of time, I'll try and be brisk. Um, so I'd just like, I'd like to go through some uh, selected research uh, highlights. To misquote Mary, who gives a vote of thanks, actually, this is difficult because it's like picking between your favorite children. I wouldn't know I don't have any children, but, um, <laughs> um, the, um, so, but I, I'm sorry to those, uh, uh, to, 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 to members of my research group whose research I'm not mentioning, it's just for the purpose of brevity. But, um, so one, one thing we started being interested in, so I already mentioned ruthenium oxide, is the best catalyst for oxygen evolution. We studied that and we made some really nice research of that with Reshma, uh, MIT, and also in, uh, in Technical University of Denmark. But it's actually, problem is, it tends to corrode away. Um, so actually, uh, as I mentioned earlier in my talk, iridium oxide is, it's not quite the tip, tip of the volcano, but actually works pretty well. The problem is iridium is one of the scarcest elements on Earth. So we need to minimize this use if we really want to make hydrogen at a large scale. There's a lot of talk now about making hydrogen at scale, but we're not gonna do it if we use current technology. So ideally what we'd like to do, we, often when we try and look for new materials, we just uh, discover new materials by serendipity, and that's, that's the standard way to do it, but I, we'd like to be more intelligent and do it by design. It'd be more fancy. Um, so then we have this volcano, which in principle has a design principle. So, um, I've shown previously the volcano actually translates uh, well for single crystals, but how do they actually translate to realistic catalysts? Can we verify it? Can we, um, can we refine this volcano? And can we actually move iridium oxide to the peak of volcanoes so we can minimize the amount of iridium that we use? So actually, um, so this is a typical example of the iridium oxide catalyst that we use. You can see that the, 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 this is a microscopy image. You can see they're quite rough. Um, so luckily, um, I've partnered up with, with uh, James Durant and Rash Marao and Ben Moss and uh, Tsai Liang, a, a PhD student who's in the audience as well. And uh, in James' group, they've been experts at actually doing uh, spectroscopy. So basically shining a light through the sample and seeing how it changes as a function of applied potential. And um, so essentially, we got this really nice spectra. I won't go into detail what, what it means exactly, but what we can tell from this spectra is actually that we can see how, how strong the binding of oxygen is to the catalyst surface. And as I mentioned previously, that's what we think controls the performance. So actually what we found is that it's not, what really controls the performance is not just how strong it binds it, but how, how much these different intermediates interact with each other. They tend to repel each other a bit. And we could tell that all from looking at these spectra. So it was really fascinating. And then we actually ended up making a new volcano. You can see the and the strong minds of the volcano ended up becoming a lot flatter than, than, than before, which is very, very exciting. So these are brand new results. And so ideally now we're at the point, so we, we can actually benchmark. So previously it was very difficult to benchmark uh, the actual experiments against uh, theoretical calculation, but now we're at the point where we actually can do that. And working with uh, Lucas Garcia and Aaron Walsh, who are also, uh, uh, Lucas as an audience, we, what we would like to do is to actually feed this information back into the theoretical models and design new catalysts that uh, reach the peak of the volcano. So finally, for the last research example, I'm gonna go back to nitrogen fixation to make ammonia. So I already mentioned the, um, 
have a Bosch process, which is currently to make ammonia, uh, results in one to two percent of global emissions, like hydrogen peroxide production, because you need such high temperatures and pressures to get it to work, you need centralized production, and then it's often tr challenging to transport the fertilizers, um, and you, uh, you end up wasting a lot of them on the way, and it causes a deleterious effect on the environment. Um, so ideally, we'd be actually taking a business model similar to, to actually uh, 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 the uh, spin-out company, HPN Alpha Hydrogen Peroxide, but also making ammonia. This is a business model of uh, collaborating with NitroVolt. You could actually use electrochemistry, make, convert nitrogen to ammonia, and then you, if, you could actually make fertilizers on site and on demand, and you can stop using excessive amounts of ammonia. And if you got really efficient, you could even use ammonia as a sustainable carbon-free fuel. But to get that to work, you need a right catalyst, and no electrocatalyst works well enough today. Conversely, as already mentioned, nitrogenase enzyme actually can do it under ambient conditions. The thing about nitrogenase is that the, each catalyst has a huge footprint, and it, you can pack a lot more active sites onto a metal surface. These, each dot here is an individual metal atom, and so you can actually get much higher rates if you were to use an organic surface instead. So actually, in, in my old research group, we looked for years and years and years to try and make ammonia using electrochemistry, and we failed really miserably for many years. But lots of reports and literature start saying they could do it. But we, we, said, we set up a protocol saying, if we were to make ammonia, this is how we proved it. And what we found is actually a lot of the reports and literature, what they were reporting supporting such small amounts of ammonia, what they're actually looking at was actually contamination from the lab environment. So it was actually all nonsense, in fact. So we actually, we had a paper in Nature five years ago. What we found is actually one paper alone actually works as a paper that barely been cited from the 90s in Japan. They essentially left deposit lithium, uh, an organic electrolyte, using chemistry very similar to, um, to, to a lithium ion battery. So the challenge in actually doing nitrogen reduction is that you've got competing reaction with hydrogen evolution. So nitrogen, these blue atoms here, are very inert, and hydrogen a lot more reactive. And typically, hydrogen will bind to the surface and stop nitrogen at getting there. So I asked my theorist collaborator, is there something special about nitrogenase and lithium that allows it to work? And the answer is simply no. So even like nitrogenase and lithium, they bind nitrogen strongly, but they don't bind hydrogen. Uh, 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 they bind hydrogen a lot stronger. So you always, if you put uh, lithium or nitrogenase into an aqueous solution, you always get this picture. You get the surface poisoned by hydrogen. So try and understand how they work. You need to think beyond how we usually think about binding different species. And that's just to tailor the environment around the active site. So what we found is actually we did some, this is work done by Ollie Westhead. She did some, uh, she did a microscopy cross-section using our new cryo microscopy sensor and found actually a very thick layer of uh, a solid between the electrolyte and the actual electrode. This is a battery scientist know this is a solid electrolyte interface. So what we think is happening is actually this interface allows nitrogen to go through and moderates access to protons and lithium, so that's how we can actually make ammonia. So it turns out that this is work done by Matthew Spry and, and Ollie Westhead, so, so it turns out actually uh, ammonia's real, nitrogen production using electrochemistry is really sensitive, just changing a salt to water concentration, you can change the Faraday coefficient, so how much charge is going towards ammonia enormously. Um, and we're, we're trying to find out why this is the case. But, uh, but the good thing is there's been a lot of progress in the field, and I was surpassed my own expectations. Now the actual efficiency to how much current is actually going to ammonia is approaching 100%, but there's still a big bottleneck. So the potential you need, so the push you require to get the reaction to work is enormous. And that's because you need to electrodeposit lithium. So lithium wants to be a salt. It doesn't want to be in the metallic state. And this is, sets a huge bottleneck in the reaction, especially if you want to use ammonia as a fuel. So I again turn to my theorist collaborator, Alexander, and also to Roman Toto, who's in the audience. We thought, what other alternatives could there be? So here's actually the reactivity towards nitrogen uh, as a function of the reduction potential, how easy it is to make a metal out of these salts. And lithium is actually the most extreme here, and that's why it's good as a battery. But it turns out a lot of other materials, like calcium or mag magnesium, even chromium, lived on tungsten, in principle could work a lot better, and they're very reactive towards nitrogen. So we thought, okay, let's, let's try some of these. Actually, they didn't work, the ones we tried. But, um, but the, just, the, um, just the same week as we published this data, um, so, so my, my, my now arch rivals, my former research group in Denmark, <laughs> they, they, they actually found that actually calcium, which we predicted to work, actually did work. 
Um, but they, they, made, they used the salt. It was admittedly a little bit more difficult to synthesize than the ones that, that we, we actually used. But I still think, so what I like to say about nitrogen reduction in general, it's very, very sensitive to the exact experimental conditions. It needs a lot of optimization. I have a lot of hope that we could actually carry out a lot more efficiently than now you can do with lithium. You just need to optimize it correctly. So now I'd like to bring you to the end of my talk. So at Imperial, I've learned uh, important support to friends and family outside work. I have a lot, I'm very happy a lot of you are here today. So tenacity is key. So you need to try, try, try again. So when I came here, I had no funding for the first three years, so that I eventually got a fair amount. Um, so I think there's much to be gained by getting out of your scientific comfort zone and translating knowledge to and from adjacent fields. So Magda's got me into biomass valorization, love and even I've got a little bit into battery science. I didn't have time to talk about it today. And the thrill of teaching intelligent students, the joy of leading a group of brilliant researchers who are now thriving in their careers. So they've got lots of prizes, permanent positions in industry and academia. So I think it's important, what's really nice in Imperial, can break down the borders between departments. You can interact with people from other departments very easily, much more than previous institutions where I worked, and get out of your silo. I think it's really, really important to find the right colleague to build a trusting network. And also it's really important to try and find out how you can make your research useful. So for example, I think what's quite nice here, we've got a lot of systems engineers, and uh, they, 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 they can, uh, Value, what, what's the availability of different nascent technology? Um, I was going to go through different technologically important challenges, electric catalysis, I think we're running out of time, so I'll skip over this. But I think what was quite interesting actually, the means to actually get to the future is now, we've all heard about AI and machine learning. Um, I think in parallel actually, there's a lot of advances in robotics, so we can actually get robots to do our experiments. I'm working with a few of you here, in particular Magda, we're trying to do that now to maximize reproducibility and throughput so we can actually put data into, um, into machine learning models. Um, and finally, so I've talked all about kind of scientific uh, issues and what's really important, but actually what's really, really, uh, what I know from my research group, there's so many in my research group actually getting jobs easily, and I think they're really talented and they deserve these jobs. But I think there's a lot of demand right now for people working in electrochemistry, but we're really lacking enough people. So we need, uh, just the same way as I feel uh, uh, it's a nice place to work in our departments because I feel it's actually normal and comfortable to be a gay man. I think we need to make other people from other underrepresented groups feel the same. So we need more people, we need to do more outreach. I've done a little bit, but there's other colleagues like Jess Wade in the department who do a lot more. I think this is really, really important if we want to really move forward in our field. So finally, I'd like to thank um, commercial sponsors and funding bodies. And I'm being a bit controversial. I have two. I'd like to thank my, first my former uh, research group in Denmark. It's one of the members is here today because she's also in my research group now as well, um, uh, Anna. And then uh, uh, also, I'm going to be a bit controversial. I'm not going to thank all the other internal collaborators, and external collaborators. There's far too many to mention. I'm scared I'm going to miss someone out. Um, uh, I'd, I'd like to finally thank my research group. They've been very, very patient with me over the years. Um, so we started with almost no resources no money, no lab, and we moved lab multiple times even during the pandemic, and they built an amazing lab here in White City, you can see in the video. So this is them right back in, 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 in 2018. They just, I just had four PhD students and a couple of master's students, they fitted into my, into my living room. And then this is us last year, we're a much bigger group now, and then this is a joint group, uh, dinner with, with Magda's uh, group. We had, uh, how many, 80, 90 people? and a third of them were from my group, actually. So it's, it's really grown enormously. So I've, I've talked very specifically about certain reactions, looking at a lot of different reactions. Um, finally, I know I'm running out of time. I'd like to thank you, the audience, for your patience, for listening to me today. I'm looking forward to talking to you at the break. I'd be delighted to answer maybe just two quick questions. Right? <laughs> Maybe we've run out of time. Yeah, yeah. 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 Hello, right. So, so it's customary in these occasions to not take questions. But, uh, but of course, Ifan is being non, okay. not, not conventional, so he's very happy to take just a couple of questions, preferably not from the in-house electrochemists. Has anybody got a question?
No. See, that was why he's such an amazing teacher, because it was all crystal clear. There are no questions. <laughs> um, so, well, thank you, Ifan. Um, I think you just said I used to be cool at the beginning of that. Um, <laughs> no, I didn't say it. I thought you talking yeah, about it. <laughs> um, so, so it's, it's my great privilege to, to give the vote of thanks to this. And I guess that since I'm now not the cool person, one of my jobs is to give you the old, interesting, slightly nerdy fact about Imperial College. And, and in 1908, most of you probably don't know, in White City, where Ifan's lab is, was the place where London hosted the first of its Olympics. And it hosted the Olympics in White City in 1908 because it had to be moved from Italy because there was a volcanic eruption, Mount Vesuvius. And it's taken almost 100 years for a more interesting story about volcanoes and White City <laughs> to emerge here in the form of Ifan. Now, you all know Ifan. Um, you're all here. You all know what an amazing person he is. I think I've been in Imperial College for 25 plus years now. I've seen many academics, new colleagues come and go, and many brilliant academics and brilliant students. But it's very rare for somebody to come into an organization like Imperial and catalyze such dramatic change that Ethan has done. He's the human embodiment of an optimum <laughs> catalyst. Um, <laughs> just by his sheer enthusiasm, energy, generosity of spirit, um, eagerness to collaborate across all boundaries. There are no boundaries of departments, no boundaries of faculties in the way Ethan approaches his work and it's an absolute joy to engage with him on science and beyond science. I think those of you that have seen his trajectory would know and we do warn our students not to go north to do their PhDs <laughs> just to be clear. <laughs> much safe, much safer to stay here. Oh, he's, yeah. he's been through you know quite challenging times in his career you can imagine him having a level of resistance that kind of belies his, his, his gentle exterior because he really cares about what he does. And he puts that passion, that enthusiasm, that carefulness into his work. And he has a purpose. If you go back, and look, again, I'm going to be nerdy here. If you go back to look at Imperial's founding charter in 1907, it's written into our legal framework, passed by the Houses of Parliament, that our founding mission is to be useful. And I think seeing Ifan wrap his excellence in science, his deep understanding of knowledge, his really transdisciplinary approach to science, and then at the end, encapsulate what we are here about, delivering impact from doing brilliant work, working with brilliant people, and being useful. Right, I'm not going to say too much more because he's clearly going, stop it, Mary. Um, <laughs> it's a great privilege to be your collaborator and your friend. Um, we're very happy that you're Imperial. Your rise to professor was you know, dramatic, um, but, but maybe too long, right? So you, you know, because he came in already a fully formed, brilliant academic. I am now standing between all of you and the conversations with Ifan and the celebratory drinks we're going to have afterwards. Please join me in one more round of applause for this amazing lecture, a brilliant scientist. <laughs> There are there will be drinks reception just out at the top for the next hour or so. Um, the, there are also no tests. I know you've probably all got panicked when you saw the Sankey diagram early on. There's not a test. <laughs> We're fine. Which test? There's no test. Don't worry, there's not a test. Thank you.